episode of Colubrid and Colubroid Radio. We are on episode 32. Uh, I am back. I've been away for a little while uh, due to work and everything, uh, but I'm really happy to be back tonight. I'm here with Clint. How you doing, Clint? Doing fantastic, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing well, too. Can't, can't wait to dive into this episode. Uh, tonight we have Glenn Brooks. From Glenn's Reptiles, and the the focal taxa for this evening is going to be Madagascar cat-eyed snakes, Madagascar ophis, uh, Colubrinus. So um, if anybody has done anything with this species, they absolutely know Glenn. Uh, He's basically kind of put them on the map as far as I'm concerned. And my introduction to them came through Glenn posting on his absolutely beautiful Facebook and Instagram pages. And I thought I need to get those, and I got them, and I've bred them, and I've raised them, and they are they are my top ten favorite uh, colubroids. So that is that. So we'll be talking with Glenn here in a here in a moment. But before we get into that, we're going to just do our housekeeping and give our updates. So it's been a while since I was on. I don't remember what I I, I recorded with April, and I think that was a little over a month ago. So we're down to what we call dead week here at West Liberty. It is the Thank the dear Lord above. It is the last week of freaking classes. So I'm going to get my life back. Sanity will invade. The anxiety that surrounds me may go away. Uh, so, um, And then it's just field season, flipping rocks and creeks and hills and mountains and looking for whatever's under them. So um, I'm kind of living for that. But in the meantime, until that happens, a couple things in my world have happened. We had a surprise yellowtail Kribo clutch here at the school. Uh, we put the animals together. All fall, well, they were snuggling a couple days, and I thought there could be something going on there. And I don't know if this is the case with other dry marken. Uh, we bred this pair before, but they just snuck those eggs right in there. I pulled the female out twice and told the grad students, there's no need to worry, she's not gravid. And then not three days later, I got a text message saying, if she's not gravid, then what are these? I'm like, oh, those are eggs. I guess she was gravid. So we have a clutch on the ground. They're all viable, too, which is cool. And then yesterday, uh, my false water cobras did something that they've never done before. Um, I have a, there's a student, technically they're not my advisee, but I'm on their committee and I'm obviously a huge part of the project, who wants to do a behavioral study with uh, baby false water cobras to see if there's any kind of kin selection. It's really cool stuff. If you incubate the eggs together, uh, do the babies kind of gravitate if kept communally to the animals that they were incubated next to, or will they just kind of disperse? And there's some evidence from some pythons that they do that, and I'm really good at making falsies, and you make a lot of them when you make them, so we end up having what we need for a thesis. And so I, I bred the false water cobras four weeks apart with the hope of them staggering laying eggs uh, so that the grad student could prepare. And wouldn't you know it, uh, the one that I bred... First, delayed or incubation or delayed fertilization, and now, last night I got well. Yesterday I got a message and it said, "Hey, you know, false water cobras laying eggs." And then on my way to school, the grad student Jimmy was like, "Uh, the other one's laying eggs." I was like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> so when I woke up, there were no eggs on the ground, and when I went to bed, there were sixty-two eggs. So these things don't mess around when they lay, and uh, wow. there was one exhausted grad student who had to take data on every single freaking egg and set them all up individually and you know whenever you try to make a plan the animals are like hold my beer we're gonna screw this up Mm -hmm. and that's basically what happened and then other than that um i bred a lot of locate locality kings at home that's my thing at home and uh i've got a lot of gravid girls there so lots of florida localities um an eastern pair and um Means eye or going eye or blotched king, whatever the hell you want to call that thing, I have Liberty Counties, and then I have uh, here in the office the Harris County speckleds, and then um, another grad student's doing hognose snakes, and I don't know if a few guys have tried to breed hognose snakes before, but they are a pain in the ass in my experience. The males just basically flop that cloaca over anything that moves and they don't care if they're mating with the female or the pine chips or the water bowl or the side of the tub and i couldn't get them to like i I, I wasn't getting any locks or anything that i could see 
And then I thought, it doesn't really matter what we make, because we just have normals. So I threw a bunch of boys together with a female, and turns out when you throw another male in there, they, they, they realize, oh, I guess I shouldn't mate with the pine chips. Maybe I should mate with the female, and that's what ended up happening. I finally got visual locks yesterday. So, uh, And this has been going on for like three weeks. It's been a little bit ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, but it's been a lot of fun the past couple weeks. Um, and looking forward to the future of this year. Once this semester is dead. So that's what my updates are. Clint, well, hold on a minute. Clint has something he wants to propose to y'all. Uh, this is pretty cool. It's an idea he has for his shop, but it has wide impact, at least here in uh, North America. So why don't you tell the listeners what you're up to? Well, absolutely. Uh, it, you know, it's been some exciting times out here at the shop, and I'll go into that uh, uh, a little bit more in a minute, but uh, what Zach's talking about is just today on the Metazotics Facebook page, uh, I, I created a post and I wanted to do something something big. And you know, while it's not massive, it, it's it's big on a on my scale, I would say. Um, so when opening the shop, we had the mentality that we didn't just want to to have nice animals. We didn't just want to have product. We we wanted to create an experience and because i mean in my opinion experiences are what sticks with you much longer than than anything material um so with that in mind i i asked myself well what are the experiences that i like that i would like to share because not everyone's going to be able to come through and, and visit the shop you know they're not going to make their way through southern indiana uh, why would you right <laughs> uh, <laughs> so i i said you know Every year, one of my favorite reptile-related experiences is the Tinley Park NARBC show, the October one specifically. I just, I absolutely love going out there. I have such a great time. I love everything I see, getting to, uh, you meet people that you've just watched online. You, you meet friends that you've you known for years and years. And it's just a wonderful time. So with that in mind, if you're listening to this and that sounds good so far, go to the Facebook page. Because what we're doing is um, I'm, I'm putting out a giveaway. On September 4th, we're going to draw, and um, it completely at random, the grand prize winner of that drawing is going to get a hotel a half mile from the Tinley Park show, completely paid for for two nights. It's already booked. <laughs> <laughs> Going to get two VIP passes to the Tinley Park show. Uh, because that's, again, I want someone, if you've already gone, great. Now you're going to get to go for free. If you've never been, hopefully this would be what would send you. Because it's an experience that I absolutely love. Uh, you know, when I was talking to Zach, I said, now there, there is a catch. Mm -hmm. And there's bonuses. Uh, the catch is, uh, obviously, I, I've got to do this to, to help us out a little bit, too. And we need to get to 5,000 Facebook followers. That's, that's the catch. For us to do this drawing on September 4th, we have to reach 5,000 Facebook followers. We're already halfway there. So done, done half the work for you already, right? Yep. Um, but I will put bonuses in there, too. If we go over 5,000, for every 500 above the 5,000 mark, first I'm going to do an additional drawing and buy another VIP pass for extra winners. Uh, and we're going to put $50 in a pot for the grand prize winner. So for every 500 above that, another $50. So that way they have some money to, to go spend at the, the Tinley Show because we know that part's inevitable, right? Yes. Uh, so so that's what we're running, and it's already gotten a lot of attention out there. Wanted to share it with all the listeners here because, again, it's it's just something I think is fun and uh, would be a good time for anybody. So, yeah, I, I think it's great. And let's be real. Let's throw some love Clint's way because Clint is everything that's right about herpetoculture. And uh, we're, we're not going to talk about the recent news in herpetoculture because it hasn't been the best as of late, and I don't want this to be a negative uh, you know, conversation, but at the same time, if we can throw out and advocate for the, the people that are doing well and we can kind of show the good side of herpetoculture, I think that we're not doing it. We're, we're just doing it our 
our hobby, our discipline, what we want. So, you know, support Clint. Can't <laughs> can't say it enough. Thank uh, you so much, buddy. I appreciate no worries. it. Uh, and the, on, go ahead. the university supported you because we sent you 50 corn snakes. Sure did, yes. 50 <laughs> so. corn snakes came from Zach, and uh, half of them have already found new homes. And uh, I, I will tell you a story that I think that you would like, Zach, is mm-hmm. – uh, on, I put a post out letting them, you know, letting everybody know that we had a lot of corns. Here's what we're going to do. And um, on Saturday morning, we had cars in the parking lot. And the very first uh, customers to walk through the door was a mother and her two young children coming yeah. to get their first corn snakes. Uh, each one of them left with one. And it, it was fantastic. It was great. So, yeah, that's, that's um, what we hoped would happen with them. Yeah, that's exactly what did. Yep. Um, now, I'll tell you, in addition to that, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of fun things going on out here. We've, I, I've seen some uh, courtship out of the Carinata, so the uh, Chinese king rats. Those are always fun. Always mm-hmm. like when we have good years with them. Um, we don't, let's see, well, we had green bush rat eggs on the ground for a while, but uh, the rest of the colubrids are now starting to go. Went a little bit later than I normally mm-hmm. do. Um, but we've got prelay sheds on things like uh, T positive, Nelson milks, um, uh, some of the black rat mutations are definitely nice. showing. So uh, getting to go through and put my color coded orange <laughs> stickers up on the females that Your I know are grabbing. And I don't have to uh, cycle anymore. So uh, that's going well. We also uh, have started our expansion into a second room for um for mice right now we do rats and mice in the same room i want to split that out uh so we are insulating studying up and all that so that's now fine it, it's you know it's it's another project that yep so seeing those projects slowly come off the list are so exciting um mm-hmm. but uh yeah good stuff going on uh, all the way around well, fantastic i'm glad to hear that the shop's going well and really glad to hear that those corns ended up in future herpers hands that's what our our goal was was with them so yeah they were part of um one of my undergrads who's going to be my grad student in the fall we we thought it'd be cool to do a study where we bred a bunch of pairs together we incubated the eggs at 77 degrees and then we incubated the eggs at 82 degrees and then we took data on those animals for the first six months of life so we kept track of everything they ate. We kept track of when they shed. We kept track of how much they weighed at different time points, how long they were. And uh, Bree is presenting her capstone this Friday. And when I look at the data, it's pretty cool. Um, corn snakes are kind of the model for snake in academic herpetoculture. And I kind of came to the realization, like, there is no paper written. And this is usually the first step when you have a model of just, like, how you breed them. And what the first six months of life looked like. And, and I thought, you know, I'm not saying this doesn't exist. There's been plenty of people that have taken data, but it's never been really, like, published formally. So mm-hmm. that's what that's what those are for. And then we got, it's really funny, we got so about a, two, three weeks ago, or, you know, the week before I messaged you, and everybody, they, they bumped up from pinkies to fuzzies to small <laughs> Salt mice and somebody came down the hallway and was like, "Can we please move these? Because they're expensive." And I was like, "Yeah, I guess that's that." And we still have thirty of them here. Like, I didn't even send you everything. Oh wow. Uh huh. So those are going to be going out to some other uh, people. But fantastic. Yeah. Well, for those who are going to receive them, yeah, you're getting some nice animals. I, I yeah. was shocked at the size, and I mean, they were absolutely <laughs> beautiful. So um, nice. Thanks again. No worries. All right, we will jump into our episode tonight. So tonight we have Glenn Brooks from Glenn Reptiles. How you doing, Glenn? Doing fantastic. Great to be here. Ah, well, we're we're very very happy to have you. So first question is going to come from Clint, and then we'll go from there. All right, Glenn. Well, we want to know about you, buddy. We want to know how you got into reptiles. What's your background? You know, how how this come about? <laughs> well. Yeah, I am. Um, I, one of the things I found interesting when I got into reptiles and really kind of took it more seriously is it seems like people kind of come into collect, uh, collecting reptiles from different backgrounds, some academic, some scholarly, um, <laughs> and others 
uh, kind of come at it because they like dark things in life, <laughs> you know, the skulls mm -hmm. and spiders and, and that, so snakes naturally attract them. And some people come to it because they love animals and specifically love keeping animals as pets. And that's really mm -hmm. how I, I came into snakes. Um, huh. I did have snakes uh, that I caught, a little decay of uh, snakes, um, when I lived up in New England in junior high. Um, but really, I didn't keep many snakes until uh, I was an adult. Um, I, I started uh, fish. I did a lot of fish tanks, saltwater, mm -hmm. freshwater, went through that whole routine. And then I just started keeping unusual animals. I had a flying squirrel and a ferret <laughs> and... You know, just a variety of different unique animals. Um, and at one point, I bought, at, at the time, a Pac-Man frog, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know that they had had, they got, had that name at that point, but Argentine Horned Toad. Um, there were no morphs. There was just a green one. <laughs> yep. And I bought this little baby that was about the size of a quarter because it could swallow goldfish and it was just unbelievable to me <laughs> and so i raised that thing to where it was the size of a dinner plate and could eat <laughs> medium-sized rats mm -hmm. adult rats mm -hmm. and it was super cool but man was it messy mm -hmm. um <laughs> and so at that point i thought you know what? i'm gonna trade it in and i had a friend that had snakes and i was kind of curious about getting a snake so I said, hey, I want, to, I want to trade this frog in and get a snake. The guy was all for it because he'd never seen one of those frogs that large. And so he was very excited about making the trade. And so I knew absolutely nothing about snakes. And this was, I was probably about 24 at this point. Okay. Um, and he took me back to a tank. He pulled out a snake, put it in my hand, and it was rolled up into a ball. It just stayed in the center of my palm, and it was clearly, back then, a wild-caught ball python. <laughs> um, and I stood there, I remember my hand shaking, holding this little tiny baby ball python in my palm, thinking, oh my gosh, it's a snake. Um, and so I started caring for that ball python, and I just loved it. I was like, these snakes are so great because uh, you can get them out, you can handle them, um, uh, at least many of them, uh, all of them that I, I'll right. say all of them <laughs> yeah, that I you have, <laughs> um, you can handle them. Uh, you can, uh, you know, they only eat once a week. They only poop about once a week, you know, so maintenance is pretty low. And, um, so I just sort of fell in love with the idea of having a snake. And then I've always, whenever I've had an animal, I've always kind of tried to, find a way to breed them because I just find that fascinating. So I looked for, uh, that was a male ball python I had. I looked mm -hmm. for a female ball python. And back then, this was before the internet, by yeah. the way. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I looked in the classified section of the newspaper, yes. which was the back pages. <laughs> you know, my, I, I imagine a lot of listeners don't know what a yep. newspaper is, much less the classified <laughs> section. <laughs> But I went back there in the for sale section and found a pair of ball pythons. Whoa. And and then I went to this guy's house with a probe that a friend had showed me. This is how you check to see if they're males or females. Never done it in my life. Showed up, got that guy's ball pythons, probed them, probed two females. And so I thought, I'll take them. I brought them home. Uh, I brought them home. I bred them, and I've been hooked ever. I mean, that was it for me. When those babies hatched out, it, well, when I got Whoa. eggs, and then when those babies hatched out, I was like, okay, what else can I breed? And so then I started getting other animals. Um, I got some corn snakes, got some milk snakes, and just from there on out, it was, you know, just an obsession with that. Um and so, yeah, I, since then, I just kind of have built my collection. Um, it used to cost me a reasonable amount of money to do. Um, and every year I would trade my animals for 
for, you know, the animals I produced for better, more expensive, different, more exotic animals. And then it just kind of built that collection more and more. And, um, and now it actually is a, a no longer costing money, but brings in a little bit of money. I, I do it just as a hobby. It's not a business mm -hmm. for me. Um, but it's, it's nice to have a hobby that's not, doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Most hobbies end up costing a lot of money. All my other hobbies. In fact, this hobby pays for a lot of my other hobbies. So, <laughs> uh -huh. can, can we know what those other hobbies are? I always love to hear what snake people's other hobbies are. Well, can one of my hobbies <laughs> um, is photography. Okay, and, well, that's uh, evident by your yeah. Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I was, that was, comment was going to come out at some <laughs> point, yeah. I, I love photography. Uh, always have been fascinated by just creating a look of things and trying to to get things to look good. Um, and since I started making a little bit money of money, then I started going, well, you know what, maybe I'll get a decent camera to take some pictures. And then I made a little bit more money, and then I'm, maybe I'll get a good camera to take some yeah. pictures. <laughs> and maybe, maybe I'll get a really good camera, then I'll get a nice flash system, and then... It just every year it's like I add something more to that. Um, some of which, and, and now I've added to it not just for snake photography, but now I've added lenses for bird photography. Mm -hmm. And I have six grandchildren, um, and <laughs> for four of them are playing baseball right now. Nice. So I get to, I, I've got lenses to go and get pictures of them playing baseball and. So, yeah, that's one of my hobbies. Um, and then the another ex two other expensive hobbies I have are cycling. Um, okay. And that costs a ton of money. Um, and then golf, which also mm -hmm. costs a ton of money. Um, mm -hmm. And really, I don't think I could really afford to do those hobbies very often if it wasn't for the fact that I keep reptiles and make a little extra income that I can then use to, to do other, other hobbies. Well, there you go. Makes Before sense. we move too far past the hobbies, I, I want to say, being that you mentioned that photography, it, you know, is, is one of that's the one thing that as soon as Zach mentions your name as, as a um, mm -hmm. guest, instantly, I think I even say, guy takes fantastic pictures. <laughs> I, I mean, that, that's it. it. It's I mean, any that's how I knew your name right off the bat was because I know your pictures. Any before I see your name, you know your, your tray uh, watermark on it, uh -huh. I can tell that that's a Glenn picture right there because yep. of how phenomenal uh, your animal pictures are. So no, <laughs> great I like job. This, I like this picture so so much in the book. Uh, people like Baron's racers and Baron I is like the most photogenic. Dip sadded in the world, in my opinion. Maybe tricolor hogs give them a run for their money, but I was having a hell of a time finding pictures, and then I realized, like, oh my god, Glenn, Glenn has those <laughs> pictures. And so, when this book inevitably comes out sometime in the next decade, uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you get to the bear and eye section and you look at who took the pictures. I think, so you know, Glenn. I think that at least the third. If not more of those of your photographs take up the bear and I section. Oh, so, that's awesome! What, what yeah, no, so that. they're they're definitely all over. That Russ and I were, were 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 tickled pink that you gave us permission to use those. So thank you. Well, you know, and part of the deal with uh, taking pictures of them is, I I love holding snakes, and part of what I love ho about holding them, it's different than looking at them in a tank. Yep. There's a little more interaction, and they're closer, and you begin to see, oh, look, that's how those scales form, or, oh, I didn't see this <laughs> color before. And so um, when I take pictures, I want to try to convey that idea that mm -hmm. this isn't just a green snake laying on a table. There's stuff going on. There's colors. Yeah. There's nuances that Scales may be emphasized in certain areas, you know, keen scales in some snakes. And I want to kind of help people appreciate the uniqueness and beauty of each of the snakes that I have. And so that's what I'm trying to accomplish with the photography. And um, it's funny, I, I constantly am switching how I do it. And then I go, <laughs> I think I got it figured out. And then I look back, I'm like, well, some of those older pictures look better than some of my newer pictures. So maybe I got to rethink it again. So. I'm always trying to dial it in. 
Very cool. Very, very cool. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna skip a on our outline, Clint. I'm gonna skip to the next red one because I think it's a good segue. Um so your collection is kind of insane. And and I I love your collection because you never know what snake picture is gonna pop up next. Like I have a tendency to be I think I figured it out just by, you know, looking at the social media feeds and then I'm like, wait, what? He's got those too? So I, I feel like if you really went over the entire collection, we would be here for like 30 minutes. C- could you just kind of give like the 30,000 foot view of the species that you're keeping? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a rundown. Part of that is um, I'm very specific about what I want. And a lot of times I'll get a species thinking this is going to work for me and I'll uh-huh. keep it for a year or two. And then I'll go, no, nope, I can't call, I can't calm it down. That's, that's one. Yeah. If something musks me every time I pick it up, it will not stay in my collection. Very long. <laughs> um, so I will tame down. I've got a lot of animals. That people say, oh, these are super aggressive animals. I'm like, not mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got um, a trio of adult uh, Bismarck ringed pythons that are mm-hmm. gentle as can be. Um, nice. Never bite, mm-hmm. never aggressive. And yeah, people talk about them as if they're, you know, uh, bitey snakes. Um, they were as babies, um, but I was able to settle them down. So some of what you see is snakes that have that I have known, <laughs> <You've> <laughs> but known. have passed on into okay. other people's collections. Uh, but I'll tell you what I'm currently. I'm gonna. I've got a list right here, so I run through it kind of quickly for you. Sure. I've got the, and I'll just do common names because I'm not very good with Latin. Sure. Um, Velvet swamp snake, tricolored hognose, royal <laughs> diadem rat snake, Peruvian calico snake, uh, red zap corn snakes, palmetto corn snakes, and scaleless corn snakes. Uh, Leonis, formerly known as Therai King Snakes, uh, Nelson's Milk Snakes, where I'm I've developed a red back line that Very is cool. pretty unique. Um, Chinese Beauty Snakes, um, but I'm working with uh, the hypo slash albino calico versions of the Chinese mm-hmm. Beauties. Um, Hundred Flower Rat Snake, Molendorfi. Um, I've got hypos and het hypos. Uh, Sonoran Desert Boas, which I don't know if you saw my Facebook feed today, but I got (laughs) a beautiful clutch of 18 um, this morning. Congratulations. Yeah, and I'm working with hypos. They're locality specific. I'm working with hypos, um, but I got leopards and some kind of annery, which surprised me, which makes me say, are they really locality specific <laughs> to have anime yeah. in there. So mm-hmm. once they get rid of their goo and shed, I'm going to mm-hmm. do, do a little more deep dive into the history of these guys <laughs> and see what's going on. But it's a pretty cool looking clutch. Yeah. But I'd, I'd be disappointed if they, if I found out they weren't locality specific, but anyway, and then I've got Tamalapis uh, cloud forest boas a locality that a, a nice dwarf boa that's beautiful and mellow as can be rough scale pythons um san diego gopher snakes uh that i work with that i've got a zombie phase that snow mm-hmm. phase that's pretty wild looking uh i work with a bunch of morphs of bull snakes i've got uh, leucistic versions of colombian rainbow boas uh, my Madagascar cat-eyed snakes, which we'll talk about mm-hmm. a little bit. Ringed pythons, which I mentioned. This is one I'm super excited about. Black-headed spotted whip snake. I don't know if you've yeah. seen those guys. I have seen those guys. Oh, my gosh. Those uh, are fantastic. I got um, – this was the first year I even tried to breed them. They're approaching adult size. And um, one of my females – I have a trio. One of my females – laid slugs this year, which I thought was a, that's a good first step. Something's Mm -hmm. happening. Um, so I think I'm going to get some next year. Very hopeful. Um, I've got some, uh, black gap alterna. Um, I've got some, uh, true El Salvadorian blood boas, um, from Pierre line. 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Sanzinia, Madagascar yep. tree boas. I got some of those. All um, uh, Mandarin. No greens. If anybody listening to this has greens and would like to sell me some, please contact me. Um, Baron's Racers. Um, blue, uh, some blue and some green. And then I have a pair of Eastern Garter Snakes. Nice. So, isn't that crazy <laughs> to throw garter snakes into that mm-hmm. mix? Um, and uh, they're albino and eerie, eritheristic. Yeah. Um, and they're really cool. And funny, I, I mean, I never thought I'd get a garter snake because what I tell you about, you got to handle it. Yeah. I don't want to get <laughs> musked. And so mm-hmm. I've never considered a garter snake. Um, but one time on Facebook, I saw this post where someone wrote, what is your favorite of all your pet snakes? And like eight people wrote Eastern Garter Snake. And I was like, how could that possibly be true? <laughs> and so I bought a pair that I thought looked great and thought I would try it. And they're great. Yeah, I um, love my garters. They're among my favorite. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's kind of, yeah, I've, I've been through a handful of other animals that I've had varying degrees of success and different reasons for getting out of certain things. But I don't have a ton of space, even though that list sounds really big. I don't have a ton of space to keep things in. So you'll notice nothing gets really big that I that yeah. I have uh, um and so they're animal. My favorite snake, by the way, Zach, is a false water cobra. Really? Yeah. Um, you have good taste, sir. Yeah, I, <laughs> I absolutely love them. I've I've owned a few over the years, mm-hmm. and I can I can keep them till they reach adulthood, and then I have to get rid of them because I don't have room for them. Yeah, they're they, yeah they they need a lot of space when they become adults. If you're doing yeah, justice. so. So mm-hmm. I keep, I generally, uh, when I've had them, I've, I bought babies and I've had them for a couple of years, two to three years. Yep. And I just love them. And then I'm like, well, now I have to sell them. I did the same thing with uh, uh, Eastern Indigos. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And in both cases, I thought, you know what, maybe th- things are always changing in your snake rooms, right? Always yeah. moving. Yeah. And I thought, maybe by the time they're adults, I'll have room to have <laughs> some big, you know, bigger cages. Mm-hmm. Maybe that'll work out. And, um, but uh, I just end up raising those animals that are wonderful, great yeah. animals. So I enjoy taking pictures of them. I enjoy handling them. I enjoy raising them. But I can't ever breed them. I just get them up to adulthood and sell them to someone who will breed them. So that was quite the list. I, I actually think you supported the hypothesis that was thrown out there before you listed the animal. Which um, was it, it would take too long? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, not that, but it was just, <laughs> you know, we have everything from eastern garters to rough-scaled pythons to ring pythons to one that was near and dear to my heart, which is slowly kind of catching on, which is um, the typhlus, the velvet swamp snakes. Um, and a little fun story about that. That pair that produced... The one clutch uh, that was showed up all over face. The female of that clutch, no, the male of that of that pair. I was supposed to get it because I kept getting girls. Oh, okay. I, I, would, I bought every velvet swamp snake that popped up. I had people like looking out for me, and I just got female after female after female after female. And then I decided, ah, crap, I'm done because um, they were crashing because they're wild caught and they do really well, and then they're dead. Like they're the right. weirdest imports yep. ever and then as soon as i gave up the male showed up and then they're super easy to breed which is what's become apparent and then boom a clutch i was like you know what you just quit like two days too soon <laughs> <laughs> so, that one stung a little i'm not gonna lie um right. but i've talked I, to the guy that produced those so he's a good guy <laughs> i'd say i think it's funny that that's the snake that that glenn started with on yes. his list because you would think, you know, well, I've got these kings, I've got these corn. No, no, velvet swamp snakes. I'm like, what? That's, that's the well, first one on the list. The, the truth is, I was just going through my albums on my Glen Reptiles Facebook page because I keep yeah. my snake pictures in albums, so I can go back and find all the pictures of that particular type of snake. So mm-hmm. it just means that that's the last one I put a picture. There you up go. Yeah. Gotcha. So gotcha. Uh, yeah. So. so- so while we're on the topic of, we might flip a, flip flip the script a little bit here. Sure. 
because I feel like this is a very easy segue into you have all this diversity. So, so how how do you go about maintaining a collection that has pythons, boas, dipsadids, lamprophyids, colubrid? Like you literally have the snake family tree in your yeah. snake room. So there's got to be. I know that our listeners would be interested to hear. How do you actually? And and it, and I don't want this to be in any way, shape, or form interpreted negatively. I'm Im- impressed because when you do take pictures of the snakes, they're all in like tip top shape. So you obviously are doing something right. So what's the? How are you able to maintain that? Yeah, it's and I would I would say uh, there's certainly room for uh, criticism with you know how can you provide ideal conditions for every one of those different types of snakes. Mm-hmm. And the answer is I don't. Um, I I try to give each animal, as best I understand, its optimal temperatures and humidity, but I have to control that in racks. Mm-hmm. And so what I do is I have racks. And I put insulation in, inside of my racks to cut down hmm. on temperature into the room and temperature into from from rack to rack from level to level and then the hotter animals i put at the top of the racks the, the animals okay. that need a hotter temperature and then um i will move down and then the coolest animals will be on the floor i control you know each level of a rack you can control that temperature individually Gotcha. And so based on, you know, if I have six that I need at a certain temperature, I'll put all of those on one controller. And then a hotter one a little bit above that. And hot, and so I, that, I kind of break it up in levels and heat by those levels. Um, so like the Mullendorfi, um, they want it cold. Uh, yeah. the, the, uh, the garters want it cool. Um, I put them on the bottom level with no heat. Um, and then I air condition the room. Okay. And so the room's air conditioned to about s- between 72 and 74. And then All they right. have hot spots based on what they are that go up. Then I choose different bedding based on humidity requirements. Um, and then I also will seal holes and ventilation okay. based on humidity requirements. Um, cool. And so that's kind of from a big picture how I try to manage temperature and humidity um, in those systems and in a in a closed room. Interesting. And what kind of racks are you using for those? Um, I have ARS racks, uh, Freedom Breeders, and then I've got one big uh, PVC rack. Nice. And is this all in the same room? Yep, all in the everything, same room. Everything you just described in the same Wow. Is in the same wow. small room. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I can't brewmate in that room because of the species. So that, that's, that's the bigger challenge is how do you – Brewmate them all properly, and again the answer is I don't, I can't. <laughs> and so all colubrids that are going to be bred go into my garage for the winter. Gotcha. Um, and I live in Northern California, and it's just about perfect to sit mm-hmm. in a garage in Northern California for the winter. Doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold. Kind of stays right in the low fifth. Well, yeah, low fifties. And then the um, boas and pythons and a mm-hmm. few of the colubrids that I don't think should get that cold. I open a window. I drop the temperature at night as cold okay. as it will get, um, which is usually low 60s. Okay. Um, and then some animals I don't – I raise their temperature up just a little bit during the day and others are feeding all winter so i raise their temperature up to normal um gotcha during the day but no heat at night and dro- trying to drop it as low as possible and so that's how i cycle boas and and pythons um i'm 
I, I do think that um, that may cause some of the challenges I've had in breeding some of those. Yeah. Um, but I'm still trying to dial some of those in and see if there's some ways to alter that. Um, but I'm having good success with boas this year so far. Sounds uh, like it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so yeah. My, my ring pythons were doing great, um, but m- you remember my rule about handling snakes. My my male ringed python that I got as a baby, I got him to settle down from biting me 70 times and, uh, and holding him for like two minutes mm-hmm. to only biting me about 10 times every two minutes. Um, and so <laughs> I found a sub-adult male on, online and I bought him. And that one I was able to tame down. And then when they were both, when he was adult size, I got rid of my biter and I immediately gotcha. stopped getting good eggs. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and so yeah. it has been Ouch. four years of no <laughs> good eggs after having beautiful clutches every year. For, well, only it was, they, it was only for a couple of years that I had him um, as an adult. And I raised them all from babies. So I just now bought a pair of sub-adults that I'm now going to have another male to try. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I put him in his in his new tub, and I literally have only had him for a couple weeks. Um, and when I went to clean his tub, there were sperm plugs all over the place. I was like, well, that's, right. a, good, that's a good sign. Nice. Yes. <laughs> nice. So fingers crossed for that. Very cool. Do, do you do... a? Single feeding a week, or do you like break it up where you do Kluberds Tuesday? You know, um, pop Bowids. Yeah. Excellent, whatever. Yeah, excellent question, <laughs> and the answer to some degree is whatever. Um, but okay. I generally feed more by size of prey than by type of animal. Okay. So, like my bull snakes will eat anything that my pythons and boas will eat, um, and so I'll do you know. Uh, small rats um and I t- a lot of my an- the bigger animals with the bigger food generally don't eat as often so i don't mm-hmm. feed them every week um and so um it kind of depends on how much time i have what i feel like doing um it takes a lot longer to thaw a, a mm-hmm. medium rat than it does a pinky um and so if i don't have as much time maybe i'll just feed my hatchling rack or my yearlings but it has more to do with size of prey item that they're eating. Um, so usually they all get fed over like two feed days gotcha. um, in, in a week, um, or at least if they're feeding that week. So it takes me two feed days a week. Um, occasionally I'll do it all on the same day. I did, I did that Friday, um, and I fed everything from top to bottom. <laughs> um, and... I was actually kind of surprised it didn't take as long as I thought it would. It only took a few hours. Well, with a collection as uh, diverse as that, I'm guessing there's also the, uh, yeah, well, this one gets fed kind of depending on what doesn't eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, this, yeah. This day exactly. too. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of like, I mean, with the Chinese kings for me, it's a lot of times there's a, well, what, what do you normally feed them? <laughs> well, sometimes it's. Five adult mice. Sometimes <laughs> yep. it's ten hoppers. You know, just, yes. sometimes it's a medium rat. Just depends on what what didn't eat that day. So. Yeah, that's that's a common <laughs> practice at our, at my place as well. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Very cool. A- any final little tidbit that you'd like to share about maintaining the collection the way that you do for for the well, listeners that we didn't we didn't necessarily ask about that you think people should know? Well, here's the thing about me. Um, as I mentioned, I kind of came into it not from a scientific perspective, although I do tend to have sort of a science mindset um, mm-hmm. in my approach. Um, and because I'm just so fascinated by each of the animals, and you know, my emphasis is in things like the photography and handling and interacting, um, I I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. Yeah, and so that's me. It's funny because you asked you asked me like, which one do you want to talk about? And I'm like, well, I could talk about this. I'm like, but they would be so much better at talking about. It. I could talk about this, but they would be so much better. At it. So I know a lot of people who are experts in all of these animals, and I've talked to them, so I gain some of their uh, knowledge. But yeah, um, so I think even with this, I, I 
I, I agree. I haven't seen a lot of people who have such a diverse collection. Um, and I, it just, it just clicked for me. I just, I, if I have a lot of one thing, I kind of go, yeah, I get it. That's, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and so I got rid of a lot of my corn snakes this last year and several of my bulls and just kind of the standard stuff. And I'm, I'm mm-hmm. kind of dialing that in. I love the, I love those animals, but I'm sort of spe- uh, um, specializing in particular morphs or, or mm-hmm. types of, of some of those animals just so I have room to yeah. do the things that I want to do. You know, Glenn, you, you, when you said you're a jack of all trades, a master of none, it's, I think I even mentioned this on the last episode, and I know it's something that I talk about almost daily uh, here. Having such a diverse group, I think it just makes you such a better keeper because mm-hmm. you have to learn so many more behaviors, so many more quirks, so many more things about so it's it it also makes you more primed for taking on a new species Mm -hmm. because you are quick to recognize oh i've seen that before Mm -hmm. you know in in this kind you know this type of animal and and it's um so you know i think that it's it truly builds us to to be better another thing that you'd mentioned it and i guess i want to make sure that our listeners picked up on this when you stated that you have your room cooled to about 72, 74 degrees, and everybody's got the hot spot that they need. That goes back to, again, a previous episode where we talked about just gradient. By giving the animals the gradient, they will take care of themselves in, in such yeah. a great way. So um, that's that's exactly why you're able to have such a diverse collection is you let them pick what they need and what yeah. they want. Yeah, you know, Clint, part of that for me is I, I I do think one of the keys to my success is I observe the animals. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this snake is off the heat every day. Maybe it's too hot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, this animal um, it, it has a faster metabolism than the others. Maybe I should feed it a little more often. Um, you know, you just kind of watch the different animals and... I've got, I I was going to have somebody come in and feed for me, but then it was like, well, that animal, you have to feed a a (laughs) pinky rat on, on tongs, that animal, you can't disturb and you got to give it a chicken leg and that, you know, and it's like, it's like, yeah, I I can't really tell you that because I've got too many animals. I mean, most of them will just grab anything you put near them. But I certainly have a large number that are like, I'll eat, but you got to give me what I want, the yeah, way I yeah. want it. Yeah, Those you got to wiggle it just it. this way yeah. on that side of my face, don't not hold, on this side of my yeah, face. Don't let it hold, <laughs> don't hold its face down. You got to yeah. hold it on the, have it face me. I will not yeah. bite it if it's facing down. I, I talk, I try to teach the students here about nuance. And I do think if you maintain, and this isn't meant to be a dig if you're listening and you're like, wait a minute, I do that. But I, I, there is something to be said about having that diversity uh, because you can totally get into a groove of what it takes to feed 50 Florida Kings. Like we, we have the Florida King collection that's in a different building and it's been kind of fun. I've got students that take care of those animals. Thank you, Jen Archer. Um, and, and they have figured out like the, the nuance of feeding Florida Kings. And I know there's people listening, like there is no nuance. There is, if you get one that doesn't want to eat. Um, and, and they have kind of figured that out. Uh, and then when they come over, you know, I had a kid tell me the other day, like the, I, I noticed that the corns eat like our, our, our troublesome corn snakes. You got to give them day old quail. But if you try to give the day old quail to the Kings, they won't touch it. But if you give them a day old chick, they're going to destroy it. And I was like, you're getting it. Yeah. You're learning the Jedi way now. You're like <laughs> yes. finally understanding yes. that it's not just, you know, mouse out of bucket on tongs feed snake. Like there's <laughs> there's something mm-hmm. to that, you know, intimate understanding of your animal. And and yeah, no, I, I love that you, you said that because I've been preaching that here with the students that are rolling through Zusai and um there's a tremendous amount of truth to that. And I I, I you know, reflecting, I definitely I, I think actually all of us, Matt, Clint, and I, that are on the show, we all have, 
what at face value may not be eclectic collections, but back at my house there are false water cobras, there are king snakes, there's Japanese rat snakes, there's yellow yeah. anacondas, there's um, my species of Erythrolampris that's still alive, the uh, yellow-bellied guys, Psilogaris, um, tricolor hogs, hognose snakes, Lewinsky, like, and I, I, I was trying to dial in for me because I thought, you're all over the place. This isn't right. And then I kind of <laughs> realized it is right because this is the way I want to do this. Yes. So yes. I have a little bit of snake ADHD. I have to I have to have my hand in a lot of pot. The one thing I have realized, though, this year um, is that the boas and the pythons are bouncing because they're, they're, I, I just have too many things that are temperate and, and trying to keep them in the space. So... I'm keeping, like, I'll have yellow anacondas and then uh, a water python, a New Guinea water python that bit mm. way too many people here at the school, has been <laughs> exiled to my garage. Um, it's actually my son's favorite snake, which means he really did get my DNA because uh. it comes out of that tub. Um, like, it's kind of the opposite of the Glenn Brooks way. <laughs> if it wants to eat my face, I'm like, you're staying. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, but no, that's cool. It's kind of nice yeah. to hear a different perspective on that. All right. Well, um, yeah, so most of those species were colubrids. There are boas, yes. and you have, it uh, sounds like a handful of pythons, but there's lots of colubrids, colubroids. So we have to ask this question because it's our, you know, it's the podcast. <laughs> what about colubrids make them the main focus, I guess you could say, of, of your collection? Yeah, they're definitely the main focus. Um uh, I just find them much more interesting interactively. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I know it seems to me like on average they're more attentive and maybe mm -hmm. I would say intelligent than the Boyds. Um, mm -hmm. And um, such a variety of colors and sizes and temperaments. Yeah. Um that I just find them fascinating to work with. Um, gotcha. Sorry. Um, oh, it's okay. You came okay. Back. I'm, I'm, can you hear me now? Okay. Sorry yep, about that. Gotcha. Uh, I got to turn my phone That's off. That's okay. Evidently, my headphones <laughs> are also connected to my phone. I didn't realize that. I thought they were just connected <laughs> to my computer. Um. So yeah, I uh, I just love colubrids. I think they're great um, animals to keep. And yeah, I had a bunch of colubrids before I um, got a started getting back into some pythons and and boas. Very nice. Very very nice. Okay. So with with that, Clint, you want to jump into the. Madagascar. Yeah, Pat let's, Iser, let's you have another forward. question. No, no, no. I think that's uh, that's where we go next at this point because it's this is it, it's funny. I, I feel like I'm repeating myself so often on some of these episodes, but it's super exciting. When I've been in this for you know 30 years at this point, mm -hmm. and I I love it when we're about to talk about a species I've never laid hands mm. on. You, you know, yeah. never had in the collection. So it's always so neat to hear. Uh, you know, not just the care, but inevitably, I, I always like to ask about the behaviors. You know, what do they do? Yep. What do they? How do they act? You know. So uh, yeah, let, let's do it. Let's get into the cat eyes. Yes. So with Madagascar cat-eyed snakes, Madagascar ophis, Colubrinus, uh, I just want to know the origin story. How did they end up in your collection in the first place? Before we dive into their care. Okay. Um, let me first correct you on. The fact that most of them in captivity are evidently not colobrophosis, whatever you said there. <laughs> not colubrinus? Not colubrinus, correct. They are mm -hmm. meridionalis. Meridionalis? Mer yes, meridionalis. There you go. Yep. That mm -hmm. is what is in most collections. Um, Interesting. Yeah. All right, cool. And so uh, the, the former is the most common um, in Madagascar, but not the most common in the area from where they were exporting. And because the okay. animal is so common there, so abundant, 
Um, they probably didn't go very far away to, in order to collect them. That's what the theory is. Uh, but I'll, I'll give okay. a shout out. Um, Roger Putris, who's uh, in the UK, he has done mm-hmm. so much real scientific research into these guys <laughs> um, that he he really has done some great work. So some of the, what I know, I know from him. But I'll give you, I'll tell you, because I love the origin story of these, and I've told it many, many times. Okay, cool. Um, I was on mm-hmm. Fauna Classifieds going, I, you know, I always look for, ooh, I've never seen that before. And when you're first starting out, yep. you see a lot of those, <laughs> right? <laughs> I've never seen that mm-hmm. before. Oh, it's a Subot. Um, <laughs> yep. you know, I've never seen that before. Oh, it's a Baird's yep. Rat. Um <laughs> but over yeah. time, you get kind of used to it, and I saw this snake with the look. It looked venomous to me in the picture. It had these big eye, big cat eyes, uh, the, the head mm-hmm. extended. I was like, what is that thing? And so it was a Madagascar cat-eyed snake. And so I wrote the guy, and I, I assumed it was super aggressive, you know, and he said, no, not at all, and it was... A, very good price um and so i bought it wasn't a big in big adult import it was a small i'm sure it was an import but it was small still and so i got that snake and i loved it it's the prettiest golden snake it's yep. got cool its body is cool its scales are cool um they're rear fanged um uh, but they are just, I, I, I tell people, I wouldn't compare them to a corn snake in temperament. I'd compare them to a rubber boa. <laughs> they are so oh, cool. mellow. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, evidently that's not always true, but that was my experience. So um, um, evidently some people have some in collections that are aggressive. Um, but anyway, I loved this snake. But it was driving me crazy because I could only get it to feed about once every six to eight weeks. And so I had a, I, at the time, I guess I knew I had a male, um, but it was driving me crazy. And I finally decided, you know what, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to kill this snake. So I ended up selling it. And then I regretted having sold it. And so I started started looking at, uh, I ran into a few other places where I saw them and I got on iHerp and this was five or six years after <laughs> I sold that. I got on iHerp. There weren't any for sale, but some people had pictures of them in their collection. So I wrote wow. to those people, sent a message to people that had them in their collection and said, if you ever produce babies, I'd be interested um, because my thinking was, one, this animal produces like crazy all over the island of Madagascar, meaning it's easy to mm-hmm. breed in different conditions. So it's, it, it can yep. live in different conditions. It can breed in different conditions. It should breed easily in captivity. But early on, people were bringing in imports, and they were dying. And so people were turned off to this species. So I thought, if I could get some captive-born ones... I can, or captive hatch, I can raise those up and I bet they'll breed great and we can start a captive bred line that will impact the the pet trade, the hobby. Um, and so I made a few contacts and stumbled into someone who said, you know what, I'm thinking, I just had a baby, I'm thinking about selling my pair and his pair was captive born. Um, from a wild caught, Ooh. from a wild caught mother, and so gotcha. I got that pair from him, and they were about yearlings, maybe, maybe two year olds, but small two year olds, and I got that pair, and it took me a couple of years to get them up to breeding size, and they bred like nobody's business, no problem, healthy eggs, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I started then I started a Facebook group that um, was specifically for them. Because I wanted to promote this. I, I'm thinking, this is like the ideal pet snake. Why do people not have it? <laughs> now, I recognize the rear fanged mm-hmm. element makes people nervous. Um, but um, 
I, I'm certainly not nervous about keeping them from, from that, um, vantage point. Uh, I just love them. They're very easily handled. They don't get big. They're small, smaller than corn yep. snakes. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe I would say they're, uh, uh, hog nose size, you know, as adults. Mm-hmm. Um, and sexually dimorphic like hognose males much smaller than the females um uh one of the things i tell people when they're looking at these is you're going to have to co- become accustomed to them not eating you have to be okay with yes. that i tell people i bet i feed my male four times a year yeah really that that was my experience no one told me that and i had the exact same anxiety induced stroke yeah. trying to like I was like there's no way you're going to live you haven't eaten for like 3 months <laughs> and then wow sure enough you know and then randomly they would eat uh yeah. so no I know yeah. that. I I did owe that yeah, exact so. I actually think I was on your Facebook page when I, I I I went there to figure out what was going on and sure enough it, there were quite a few posts that said it's normal yeah. like be still yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so um <laughs> Yeah, so I just got into it. The Facebook page connected me with Roger, who had been into it for years, and he really focuses on this species uh, over in the UK. Um, and then there's a few folks in the U.S. and a few folks internationally that are that are really into them. And then we've got a, a more and more of a smattering of of uh, people uh, like you, Zach, who are saying, "Hey, this is a great animal." and and now you can find them all around, captive bred. They're they're pretty readily available. Um, I just I got two clutches of eggs in my incubator right now. They were the first ones to go for me this year. Um, and um, now my females, every time I open the tub, want to take my fingers off. They are immediately looking for food, <laughs> but they wouldn't eat for like mm-hmm. five months. <laughs> Now they'll eat anything, wow. and the yeah. mouse still isn't that interested in eating. But I did get him to eat a live uh, mouse the other day. So, yeah. whenever snakes have that feeding pattern, it, it it usually relays back to where they yeah. come from, and they're basically in a system where there's boom and bust. So, part of the year food is everywhere, and you just gorge and gorge and gorge, and then the other half of the year. If you slither out of your burrow, tree hollow, whatever it may be, you're going to cook to death and die. <laughs> so you got to get all your calories in that six-month window. Yeah. Um, and once I realized that's what was going on and it wasn't reflective of my care, yeah, it's still it's still anxiety-inducing. But at the same time, it was like, okay, well, maybe this is all right because, you know, we're reflecting the boom and right. the bust. Right, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I just cool. think they're great, and I, I felt like they were underrepresented in the hobby. So many people who would would like an interesting small colubrid, they should be lining up for these. Yeah. Well what I what what drew my attention to them almost immediately is I remember when I first saw a, a picture of one, this was back in 2016 I think. It was right when I was starting the Zeusai stuff. Um, I I thought to myself, what species of Boiga is yeah. that? And then I, I looked and was like, wait, that's not a Boiga? Like, wait, huh? Yeah. Um, because that that head, and they're filling a similar niche to Boiga in Madagascar. Uh, but they're definitely, my, I, I've kept Boiga, I've kept these guys. These guys are way, like, granted, they go on the hunger strikes. But they also were a lot easier to get, like you were saying, up and established and going than the, the Boiga oh, that yeah. I've had in the past. Those were kind of a pain in the ass to get, you know, settled to the point that, you know, they were they were heading towards a stable existence. Um, these guys, when I when I got my first pair, and I ended up with 2.2 of them, um, and have, I, I produced multiple clutches, uh, they, I must have gotten them during the, the boom, be- thank God I did, because they ate right away. I don't know what would have happened if I got them and they didn't eat for five months. Um, but yeah. Anyway. When, so, so do these guys uh, readily take rodents? I mean, even as juveniles? Um, or that's a great the... question. Um, that was one of the big challenges with these guys. One one of the advantages is they're a small snake that will take a baby pinky when they when they're born when they hatch. 
Um, and so to me, that's the critical thing. It, you can't keep a snake or it's hard to keep a snake that's so small that when it has a baby, it's really hard to feed the baby. Um, I think we all kind of mm-hmm. experienced or are familiar with species that are like that. So these guys will eat a small, you know, newborn day old pinky from the get go. Um, and what I've experienced is if you gently open their mouth and put a frozen thawed pinky into their mouth, they will then grab it with their rear fangs and you can gently set them down and they will just work their way fang to fang all the way down the, the, uh, the pinky and eat. So hand, I wouldn't, it's not force feeding and it's not really teeth mm-hmm. feeding it's gently opening up their mouth, putting it in there, and then they grab it. And I would say 90 to 95% of my babies will eat like that um, when they're born. Um, and one of the tricks to that is after they've eaten a few times generally, what I will do is I will feed them at night. I'll put a pinky in their little tub. And then in the morning, I'll come back, and if the pinky's still there, then I'll feed them that way. And eventually, Mm -hmm. they will start picking it up in in the night. And so then you don't have to feed them that way anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nice. It's a a great system. They're easy animals. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I asked that question because it's – Whenever we talk about a, a snake that it's pretty and, and seems easy, I always wonder, you know, why hasn't this exploded, right? Mm-hmm. Why isn't this snake more popular? And, of, of course, the rear fang aspect is probably what slows it down. But normally my mind goes to probably a lizard yeah. eater, you know, or probably once frogs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is, is that what has kept this species from from really going mainstream type of thing? So. Uh, so yeah, just, just yeah, and I don't know how many people have struggled because they don't readily, they don't you know, a small percentage of them will take a pinky just thrown in there and you leave them to their own devices, um, and it mm-hmm. doesn't seem to help much by giving them a live pinky. And I've tried a few different scenting techniques, and those were not great. But usually they would eventually <laughs> eat, given enough time. But this method of just placing them in their mouth, they eat and they start growing. And um, it's yeah. it's a nice uh, solution. I, I've got several other species that I wish were so easy to get going. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. When I, I didn't know that trick, and what I was doing with, with my clutches is I was just basically keeping them all together in a single shoebox, uh, six quart uh-huh. tub, yep. I think, is mm-hmm. the standard. I don't yep, know if that's I've got right. the measurement six there. Quart. Yep. Yeah, and then I would have um, mulch, a little water bowl, some sticks because they are very active at oh, night. Yeah. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and then I just basically had a little glass bowl that I would put a bunch of pinkies in, and then, like you said, I just like watching them. So I'd put that in there, and I would like go out to watch TV at night with all the lights off, and just have the tub next to me to make sure. They're not accidentally grabbing the head and the butt and the lady and the dressing yes. it and eating yep. each other. <laughs> um, but there would always be like a third that would just eat right yep. off the bat like that. And then after four or five of those, it was kind of fun to watch them because those troublesome eaters, usually by the second or third feeding, and then the other ones are starting to get a little bit bigger because they've eaten every time. You'd see them kind of go over and be like, "All right, what the hell is this whole thing about?" <laughs> so they learned. It was like, learned and, behavior. Yeah, and 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 then uh, I had one that didn't eat uh, ultimately, but other than that, I last year I had a, I made over thirty of these things, and I got all of them to 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 take by you know after doing that trick. So they are, for what they are, they are remarkably easy to get started as a little colubrid. That's that. We would probably put the the title of oddball on them, but for an oddball, they're a pretty easy yes, oddball. Absolutely, yeah. So, I would say that. Nice. Yeah. So, as far as like keeping is concerned, um, what would be the setup that you had them in? 
Um, I keep them like I keep my North American colubrids. Um, the, you know, okay. a corn snake, if you will. Uh, so they've got a hot spot of 82, uh, maybe 84, right in that range. Um, I keep them on a kiln-dried pine bedding, and I always give them a humid hide. And okay. they spend a lot of time in the hide, and then always fresh water, obviously. Um, and uh, and that's pretty much all they need. They'll hang out at that hide, they'll come out at night, they'll roam around, see what's happening, and... Uh, Feed and breed. And both, by the way, I keep my three, I've got a trio of uh, gold adults right now, and I keep them together 24 7. Well, not, well, I feed them separately, but I keep them together yeah. all year round. Yeah, I, I started doing that as well, actually, which is kind of yeah. cool. Um, I had mine in a, a 4x2x2, by two by two, and I just bought some. Uh, Pothos plants and uh, mm-hmm. snake plants. Oh yeah! For my own amusement, threw them in in that cage and gave them a bunch of like areas to climb. Basically, set it up the way you would for like an Amazon yes. tree boa. And that when I had them in there, that became my absolute favorite vivarium in my office at school. Uh, because or sorry, my office at work. No. Jesus, school and work are the same. <laughs> My office at home. That was funny. I was like, what, where do you work? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it might tell you where, how much I, time I spend here. Um, anyway, but th- th- they were great. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, they were so active. They were up and down and moving around and um, inquisitive. They would, if you kind of rattled your fingers on the glass, they would kind of come over and, and check it out. So, those of you that like naturalistic vivaria, they're really, really, really cool, and that's set up as well. And and since Glenn mentioned they don't get that big, if you give them a rather large viv, you know you, you're not going to see them much during the day. But that hour after the lights go out, they got zoomies. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, no, very, very cool. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so. What's the the breeding behavior like? I mean, are you you said you keep them like corn snakes? Are you cycling them like um, corns? I mean, what do you guys do? I uh, I'd be interested in hearing what you do, Zach. I have um, cycled sure. them um, every year up until this year. Um, and this year, I thought, you know what? They're from Madagascar. My Sanzinia Madagascar tree boas are from Madagascar. Maybe they have similar winters, so I kept them in. With my boas and pythons, <laughs> um, and so I, I call it gently cycle, gently cycled those colubrids, yep. and um, and I had a bad clutch and a great clutch as far as um, fertility, and so when I had my bad clutch, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, and then when I got my great clutch, I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm a genius. <laughs> yeah that's how that works <laughs> uh what i would do i had them all together in that big viv and um i turned off the halogens and just let the leds light it up and then i lowered the light cycle and i thought i was being all swanky and uh they did not breed under those conditions and so then what i did is they were in the vivaria uh, for like the the spring, summer, and fall, and then around Thanksgiving, the classic Thanksgiving, the Valentine's Day mm-hmm. thing, I moved them all from. You know, they were in the Vivaria. I moved them into a rack that is in my office at home. Not at that time. Uh, that Nailed is right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that is next to a window, and I keep that window cracked. So they definitely had a drop. Um, and I did that three years and like that exact. Right scenario you're in the rack you're in the viv all year until it's winter time then you're going in the rack and uh they bred after that every every season and they they probably would have bred in the vivaria but i knew they were going to breed in the rack but i wasn't dropping them down i mean that might i mean it gets cold in west virginia so no matter what our houses experience a dip in temperature Mm -hmm. um so i think that i was dropping them probably down to around the upper 50s low 60s at night 
and then upper 60s, 70 during the day. Yep, that'll do it. Um, but it, I never saw a lock. I never saw a breeding behavior. I just would pull the females out, usually around the end of January, February, and we noticed they were kind of plump. And then by the end of Feb, by the beginning of March, they were like, yeah. they were obviously Yeah, you can drowned. see that hanging down there. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. I um, just this yeah. last week uh, hooked up a new system thanks to technology where my lights in my room are on daylight hours. Um, so it nice. automatically mm-hmm. adjusts based on sun, sunrise and sunset. And I was toying with nice. setting it for some time other than my time, you know, like Madagascar time. <laughs> but then I yeah. thought, yeah, you know, but the temperatures and things are all going to be relative to my time. So I decided to, yep. to set it with, with my time, but I have a small window in the room. Um, so it it did give a little bit of a light cycle, but it was pretty dark in there during the day. And I thought maybe some of my animals would do a little better with having real daytime and nighttime and having those the length of those days change seasonally. And so, um, yeah. you know, those are those are the things we kind of try and learn as time goes over. And I I'd never done it before, and I just started about four days ago. So. I keep yeah. trying to turn my light off when I leave my room. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I have those exact. I have similar uh, smart plugs, yeah. and I, I. What made me do that is I. I, I don't know why I, I. Absolutely went off the nerd deep end last year, uh, when we recorded that Brumation Bonanza episode mm-hmm. of Infamy. Now, <laughs> um, that was kind of self-serving. Like that gave me a reason to read all that stuff uh and when i did that like kind of deep dive i i realized in reading all the literature that the you know herpetologists have done is that we do put a huge emphasis on temperature but i feel like after reading that um there's a there's a whole group of hormones that are only controlled really by light hitting their retinas so these light cycles i think matter way more than we realize and it, yeah, I think that's also why people can do the, the light cycling and the food mm-hmm. cycling and right. skip the temperature and then they get yep. eggs. Uh, and I think that if people go to the, the plugs so that you're matching, you're dialing that in, I, 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 yeah, that's an area that we're going to be doing stuff here at school with. Just And like I said, it's just my curiosity because I, I, I think it's really cool that you can breed things without necessarily dropping their temperatures like way down yeah, low. The, the other element is for those people who use rack systems, a lot of ball python in particular people use tubs that don't let light in. Even if you do have yeah. light, they don't, mm-hmm. that doesn't let it in. Mm-hmm. And I actually bought my freedom breeder with all those kind of gray tubs. And I ended up over time replacing every one of the tubs just because mm-hmm. every time I opened it, my animal was like, what's going on? And but, <laughs> yep. but with the clear ones, when you, they were they were noticed when I came in. They noticed what's what going on. You open it, and they're not surprised mm-hmm. that something's there. And it just seemed yep. like it was a better experience for them, I guess I would say, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. instead of being kept in the dark all the time. And I think maybe some people – I actually have a few of them, a few of those dark tubs um, – in case I have an animal that seems too skittish to eat, then you put mm-hmm. it in there and it has very few distractions and maybe then mm-hmm. it, you can get it eating. So just, you know, we got all these different tools we can try and do different things with and based on the animal's behavior and and how they do for us, we, we can try different things. You know, I think when it comes to the lighting, it, it's... <laughs> It's got to affect it in some way, it, yeah. you know. It, it's it's just more naturalistic, and I guess it, it's on one extreme. It would be yes, it's going to trigger phenomenal breeding behaviors or you know things internally, or worst case scenario, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> you know what no, I mean? No, it doesn't. It, it, it's that, that's what it comes down to. Is it could it could only help. It, it mm-hmm. couldn't yeah. hurt. You know, so there's really not a reason to not try it, not go for yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that we need to do a lot more thinking that way, Clint. Mm-hmm. Of when we get when people get into their silos and they're like duking it out, 
uh, which in itself is not overly necessary. But uh, yeah. if, if you're, you know, if you're doing something that's going to increase the experience of the snake while it is alive on this planet, we might as well do it. Like, there's just no reason not. To. Well, so. and it it goes to you know, <laughs> like the the studying of it, you know, on on your end, where even if we as hobbyists can't see a change in behavior, that doesn't mean that the light cycle is not doing something physically. Yeah. You know, in turn, just mm-hmm. like you said, when you just said that, you know, there's hormones that are triggered from light hitting the retina. I'm an idiot that's never heard that before <laughs> in my life. <laughs> I mean, so I just learned something. But that's what I'm getting at is, you know, we may or may not see a change in the behaviors of someone who's the keeper. But it doesn't mean that there's not, you know, physical traits taking place and and, and really that uh, that are beneficial and it, oh, yeah. who knows that light cycle may add two years to the lifespan of that snake that we would have never even considered the correlation or, you know, because of whatever it's doing internally, we've never thought of or paid attention to. Okay. Yikes. Well, while we're waiting, hopefully that Glenn will pop back on. I want to reiterate what he was just saying there. Uh, I mean, some very fantastic advice and that's, mm-hmm. Saving fifty dollars, saving a hundred dollars on an animal up front, versus all the time, all the care, all the money that's going to go into them over the course of the years of life. Hopefully, the years of life that that animal is going to have. I mean, that's we just need to think through that into a, a much better and higher degree. Uh, so that was, I mean, great advice there, Glenn. Um, I also like that when thinking of a, a species that you want to work with. The, the way that you're going to set up with somebody a year in advance, six months in advance, that kind of thing. So, yes, I, I, one of the things I always kind of point out to people is I say, you know, if you're spending a thousand dollars on snakes, how much are you spending on caging? You yep. know, it's little things like that where it's invest right. in what you're doing. Don't just you know, putting all your money in animals without thinking through, thinking long term. So, spectacular advice there, Glenn. Yeah, and, and snakes are expensive to yes, feed. Yes. Um, you know, it's that's a lot, and getting more expensive every day. It mm-hmm. seems um, it's uh, that's a lot of money you spend. Um, and so, I do find it fascinating when people are nickel and diming somebody for twenty dollars. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I, if you can't afford the snake, you can't afford to own this. <laughs> yes, you can't afford yes. to feed it. A hundred percent agree. I, Whenever I'll get asked if I'll do a payment plan on, you know, a hundred and twenty five dollar animal, I I don't think it's it's right for you. It, you know, I think mm-hmm. that Yeah. Let's push put this off a year and let, let's see where mm-hmm. you're at. You know, it's not not to shame anyone, just kind of to your point where we need to be able to fund taking care of them, not just fund oh, acquiring them. So no, I agree. Yes. With 100%. Absolutely. Um, I've got one more just general question, uh, and I think that this is a good one for, for somebody that's you know had the diversity that you had. And this is for you too, Clint. Uh, so one of the things that we, I made the jump into the Getula kings, I call them Getula kings, but basically everything that used to be a subspecies off of Getula. So mm-hmm. that includes, except California kings. I have a couple of those, but not many. So that's like desert kings, speckled kings, eastern kings and then a whole bunch of florida kings and it's been kind of fun having this like large specialized collection at the house but one of the things i've noticed is i got a whole bunch of um older babies is the way i would classify them. they weren't fresh out of the egg but they definitely were not sub-adults and they're all being fed the same way they're all in the racks the grow out racks um, ultimately to go to either bigger racks or into my vibs that i have and I've noticed that, like, I have some of those little boogers. They're eating the same. They don't have a problem eating, and they just won't freaking grow. And it, you know, my biologist brain can't accept this. Like, I lay awake at night trying to logic my way out of, like, what the hell is going on? And I've deduced, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> like, there's no, it has to, it could be genetics, it could be whatever, but I have, like, siblings. Where the the sister, the female, is huge and the brother is small, 
And with those kings, normally the males are bigger than the females, just a little bit. Not by much, but they're definitely bigger. Is this is this something you all have ex- experienced, you haven't experienced? I'm just curious to see, given the multitude of critters that you've kept. Yeah, I, you know, as I think about that, I can't think of, I don't have snakes that can eat every <laughs> time. You know, every time I feed, some yeah, eat, yeah, some yeah. don't eat. And I have enough that it's really hard for me to, I, I will keep track of the first five or six mm-hmm. times I eat. And after that, I think established, I'm not going to write down every time a, a baby eats. Um, and so um, if I saw that, I would think, well, is this one just refusing more than the other one? Um one of the things that I do notice when I do have a little discrepancy is I, it's like I'm going to give the smaller of the two mm-hmm. fuzzy mice to the smaller yeah. snake because that's size appropriate. So I'm, I'm actually encouraging one to grow more, yeah. the bigger one to grow more than the other one. I mean, that may be part of what's going on. May de- be, you know, temperature. I, I'm always fascinated by how some tubs yes. right next to each other can be different temperatures for some mm-hmm. rare reason. <laughs> um, and so if it bothered me, I'd try to figure those things out. Um, but otherwise I just say, <laughs> well, that's yeah. the way life is, buddy. I, I have literally, it's funny you asked this question today, Zach, <laughs> because just today um, I'm going through, I have a, a associate here that he takes care of, you know, most of the snakes. I've kind of taken the Asians back on because we weren't, mm-hmm. things weren't going quite the way we yep. needed them to in there. Um, again, it's not something you're familiar with. I know the behaviors, right? Just like yep. we were talking about. The earlier. nuance. Exactly. Um, but as I'm going through our holdback room, um, I'm, you know, kind of pulling some um, tubs and one of them I opened up and there's a, I want to say it's like a salmon, coral, ghost, corn snake. And I look at it, and I look at look at him. I go, "What the hell is going on with this snake?" And he's like, "What do you mean?" And I go, "It's a twenty-one, you know. So this is a you know, not quite two years old, but and this thing is it's not even quite as big as those babies you just sent me. Really? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, what the oh, hell wow. is going on with this thing? And he he looks at the car. And he says. It's eating every time. I, I, I don't know. I don't <laughs> yeah. know what the deal is. It's not like it's refusing. It's not having regurge problems, anything like that. Now, I mean, last year I did cool down all the holdbacks, which I don't usually do. I, kind of, I just needed the break, yeah. right? We, we needed to be able to regroup. Uh, so, you know, it lost that growth. But just the fact of I think no. they're, it's why they lay 10, 12, 20 <laughs> eggs because you're going to have some that, just fail to thrive and even the ones that do survive they just may not be you know the the norm and so i think there's i'm sure there's a million other things that go into that as well you know the the temperatures that you know whatever but um i i just think that every now and then there's those animals you know it's even siblings in i mean in us you know what i mean when you look you've got some are going to be six, seven inches taller than the other one, you know, and they've uh, eaten the same food and grew up in the same house to the same parents. So I think just sometimes there's those flukes. Yeah, you know, I just have this comes. this yeah. one grow out rack. It's in in the office at the house, and it was really weird because it also defied logic because the top is warmer and the bottom is colder, and the snakes at the bottom were growing much faster than the animals at the top. It, this grabbed my brain so much in the past 12 months that last summer I took my govies that I used to track temperature and every tub in that rack had a govy in it. Like the govies went from across the garage everywhere into this one little reptile basics rack where the grow outs were and I moved the snakes around like musical chairs. There was no temperature differential. Like you, like your associate said, the, I mean it's a king snake. It's going to pound food no matter what. Um mm-hmm. And right. they just, they just won't grow uh, at like at the same rate because the animals that were growing uh, fast at the bottom of the rack, I moved them to the top, and the animals at the top that were growing slow, I moved into the bottom. And it, it's more like I'm not upset; they're still going to be breeding size when they're supposed to be. Uh, but it's more of just a like, what the hell? Like, 
you know, I got to figure this yeah. out. Like it was one of those kind of things more than anything. But I was just curious if you've had yeah, that. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's, well, or not. And then um, I would sit here and it's just where kind of like, you know, the mm-hmm. different ideas start rolling where if it's temperature related, you know, instantly you think, okay, well, warmer ones are going to be eaten better, things like that. Yeah. But when they're all eating, then you start to think, okay, well, the warmer ones are probably digesting faster. Yeah. Faster metabolism. Too quickly, yeah. And then, not, and, yeah, they're not yeah, and if we're feeding everything it. on the same routine, they're actually, you know, they're a lot hungrier by the time mm-hmm. because they're, you know, burning through. Some, it's it's all no. this. You know what I mean? It's I'm going to leave it to smart guys like you, Zach, <laughs> to uh, – well, the smart guy out. doesn't know what the hell's going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, that's the advantage. That's the advantage of not doing yeah. the study. Factors. Yeah. I can answer the question either direction yep. with a very good, solid answer. Is that right. right? I have to have like small multiplication right. or sorry, yeah. replication, and you know. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's anyway. too much. Hassle. All right. Well, well. <laughs> I will be paying attention to that, though, Zach. Now that you mention that, I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. pay attention and see if I notice any <laughs> right, of those cool. things. Uh, that's fascinating. Well, we're nearing the end here, and so our Matt made this up, so this is in honor of Mr. Most. Um, but we started asking people near the end. Last question is kind of where do you see herpetoculture kind of in a year, two years, five years, ten years, and and. We can give a spin because I can tell you that Clint and I are here on the east, and you are obviously, you know, on the west. And I, I feel like it's just a little bit different being a herpetoculturalist on the other side of the continent than it is over here. Um, so, what, what are your perspectives on on all this? Um. Yeah, I think I think there is a real threat to our hobby. Um, and I equate it to smoking. Um, you know, I, I personally don't smoke, but I think people should have the freedom. I don't think we have to, we should protect people from themselves. Yeah. That's, um, I'm, I'm not a big politics guy, but that's just mm-hmm. kind of my mm-hmm. deal. And I think it's ridiculous that we make people wear seatbelts. <laughs> um, now that being said, I think yeah. everyone should wear a seatbelt. All the time. I think it's crazy. I think it would be crazy yes. to not. But to make it a law seems super mm-hmm. weird to me. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of my... But here's the thing about smoking. Every time, especially out here in California, every time a law or a tax comes in that says we're going to hurt the smokers, it always passes because most people are not smokers. <laughs> and so they, they're not thinking... What about the freedom of those who choose to smoke? Instead, they're thinking, well, how's it going to affect me? What do I like or not like? And I don't like smoke in my restaurant, or I don't like smoke out at the park. So let's make laws against that, just because the majority feel that way. And um, the majority of people do not yes, like snakes. Right. Um, I, I am reminded of that weekly. Um, and so... Uh, I do think as soon as the states start going, you know what? I'm worried about invasive animals. I'm worried about rear fanged venoms. Mm-hmm. They don't, I don't know anything about it. If their perspective is, I don't know anything about it, but it sounds bad. Let's make a law. And everyone's going to go, that sounds like a great law because I don't mm-hmm. like snakes and I'm afraid of them. Um, so it does concern me kind of culturally how we're moving uh, as a nation and, and to some degree uh, in my home state of California um, because I think there's a good chance we'll lose some liberties in that regard um, just because most people uh, they're, they're not protective of our liberties and they're afraid of something yeah. that we like or they don't like right. something that we like and so I think we're maybe in a, a difficult spot um, we'll see um, uh, I'm I'm always pleased with how many species and things I can keep in my area. I'm not a venomous guy. I, I, I've got too many <laughs> grandchildren to yeah. have any venomous snakes around me, um, and so uh, you know that's that's a whole different kind of issue. And I'm not a big snake guy because um, I don't have the space for it, and I'm, I'm, I don't really find them nearly as engaging as some of the smaller ones anyway but um 
Now, that's just personal preference. And so in California, there aren't a lot of things that I go, oh, I can't do that because I'm in California. Uh, most everything I want to do, I, I can do. But things like even the Madagascar cat-eyed snakes, I know people who say, oh, no, they, they're rear-fanged and I can't do that. I think New York City mm -hmm. has um, some kind of requirements there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Really, it's, where you it's, are? It sounds like it's getting a little gray here because um, – in, in Indiana, the law, as it was written previously and, and as I read it, um, it was you know, no venomous, no rear fang venomous. Um, however, things like hog nose were perfectly fine, right. but it didn't specifically <laughs> state that. It was more, I think, just potentially DNR just looking the other way on it. Um, but I think now it's being – it's written where um, anything that – can, is fatal or has the ability to cause severe bodily harm, which now that's really giving us a gray area on, you know what I mean? What, who considers this, yeah. that, you know, what rear fang? So right. it's, it's But I'll take that gray area over no Correct. rear fangs. Correct, correct, yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think... Uh, that's a potential problem. I also think there's a problem that potentially happens to the hobby by the hobby itself, and that is it just seems like more and more people are breeding. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I mean, I don't I don't know a lot of people who want to buy my snakes personally. I have to sell them through mm -hmm. Morph Market. You know, and it just seems like when is this market going to saturate? Mm -hmm. um, and I... I've I've just been shocked at how much how many animals and by the way that's also part of the reason why I don't have forty you know Leonis king snakes because I'm like what am I going to do if I produce that that many babies what am I going to do with yeah. all those um, so anyway I think there's the potential of us kind of saturating the market interest wise. Um, and it's one of the things that also sort of uh, supports my my attraction to the lesser kept species because all people oh, yeah. are always interested. A hundred percent, yeah, I, I agree with that. If you keep your you keep the thing that not everybody else has, and you'll never have a problem with having too many of them. <laughs> you know, it's uh, that happens. Yeah. You know, an interesting thing I learned when doing the kind of the research uh, prior to opening up the shop here. Um, creating the business plan and whatnot. I believe it was in 2020, the number of reptiles in uh, U.S. households surpassed the number yep. of dogs and cats in U.S. households. Wow. Um, now, given there's several of us that have 300 <laughs> of them in a basement, so we could be skewing the yeah. numbers a little bit. <laughs> sure. Uh, but I also, sure. I, I believe that, uh, like in previous episodes, Zach, when, when you talked about the the Steve Irwin and mm -hmm. um, uh, Jeff Corwin, that mm. type, yep. that really set, you know, a, a movement um, in interest. And I think that. Um, the explosion of YouTube and the YouTube yeah. channels and and all that it's we are still the minority in terms of enjoying reptiles but I think that there's still a lot of market space yeah. meaning a lot of minds that okay. can still change and the younger generations are already you know they they're much more into it than um, than before so I think that it's it's easy to saturate in some of the very commonly kept and mass produced and, you know, how many people want a normal ball python at this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. But uh, I think you're, you're certainly right on the uh, having the things that not everybody else has, which you, you've got a list of. Yes, you like, do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it keeps you You are the engine strong. for that good. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, I... I, I have had many conversations with people who said, I'm going to buy a snake as soon as I move out of my mother's house. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> See, now whenever I've got them where they bring their mother to me to yeah, convince them because they can walk in. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Good stuff. Very cool. So any final thoughts before we wrap this up? 
Well, I, I really appreciate you guys uh, having me on. Oh, you know what? I, I think we would be remiss to not mention that there are different color oh, phases. Yeah. Of oh, wow. I don't know. Mad I can't believe we didn't do that. Yes. Um, so gold is by it far is the, best. the best. I agree with <laughs> you on that. <laughs> Without question. I, I, I would say there are two color phases, gold and then yeah. the ugly ones. But I like that. other people... <laughs> mm-hmm. Other people are very committed to what they call mm-hmm. silver, which is sort of anery-ish looking, yeah. um, uh, but uh, gray maybe is a, a better descriptor of what it is, but it's gray-brown, yeah. and then there's another color that I guess technically the, the marketing color is bronze, which we would know yes. as brown mm-hmm. in Dirt, yeah, dirt, dirt brown. colored, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. dirt brown. Uh, but I will say all of them are are cool. It's cool to have. I've had all of them at different times uh, together, and that's kind of fun too. Because they, they're you know when you have something, it's nice. It's fun to have something yep. a little different. Uh, but there are a few of those different options, and um, and it's funny because I'll have people hit me up every year and say, hey, do you have any silvers? Do you have any browns? And I'm like, no, I'm only doing golds now. And they go, oh, well, I I'm in, I want to get a silver or a brown one because I hear they're more rare. <laughs> and I said, they're more rare because they're <laughs> ugly and nobody wants them. Yeah. Yeah. I- <laughs> so I will say that first one I had was a beautiful gold, and that's the one I fell in love with, and I still yeah. love the gold. I, 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 had, I had a gold male and a a, a a dirt brown. I, I I'll go with that. We'll we'll mm-hmm. call it that. Massive female. Um, that was a full third bigger than the male. Uh, and they were fun to breed because they would throw. Like one year there would be more golds than browns, and then the next year there would be more browns than gold. I never was able to figure it out. And one of the cool things about Mad Cats on that line of thought is that these color phases all occur naturally in Madagascar. It's not necessarily a product of selective breeding. If you go on to iNaturalist, you can see oh. them all. And they actually led mm-hmm. to some problems when they were trying to figure out what what constituted a species because they were pulling, like, is this a different species? And then they figured out, oh, no, it's not. It's just, you know, so just color faces. Yeah, you can't go by mm-hmm. color. you got to go yep. by scale yeah. count. And even that, especially with uh, species that have been bred, in the U.S., um, a lot of them have been oh, yeah. crossbred. All um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. Did you, Zach? Did you have any that were kind of in between? Was, yeah, exactly what I was going to ask. I that, that was my that. question. Yeah, I experienced that. I had I produced I, I bred a brown to a, a gold, and some were dark brown, others were bright gold, and others were kind of dirty. Yeah, gold I would say that brown. I got the dirty gold brown. <laughs> I like that, by the way, um, because they were I saw the pictures of the silvers. I know exactly what you're talking about on that front. And uh, these things popped out. Well, I actually to back that up one more step. I, when I really got into them, I thought, "Ooh, you know, I like these. I'm going to buy another pair. And so I waited and I tried to get the silvers and I bought the silvers and I got the silvers and I thought, what? <clears throat> like, this is not <laughs> as advertised. <laughs> this is just like a more lightly colored dirt brown than my dirt brown. That's that's how so, I describe um, them. Yeah. And I and I raised those those two up. And last year I bred the gold male I had um to one of those so called silvers and I got all kinds of crazy stuff and I was just I just ended up mm-hmm. calling them mad cats. Like I did, they weren't because you know I didn't want to call them gold. Yeah. But I don't know what the hell they were because I had that that exactly what you're talking about that kind of um, continuum is what I would explain. I definitely had some that were yeah. like, and it was kind of interesting because it was a gold to the silver female, and I got the classic dirt brown color, and I actually liked that color because it, it in the naturalistic vivarium they're cool because they blend in so perfectly. That you don't like on cork bark tubes and things that you don't even realize you're looking at the snake. Like they look like a liana or something, which was kind of cool. Um, but no, I, I know, yeah. So I, that kind of poly. And the thing, the thing I like, 
Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. The thing I like about the brown ones is they tend to be a higher contrast yes. in the mm-hmm. in the two colors, so that you know, their patterns are more yep. distinct. So I do mm-hmm. like that about those. But yeah, uh, there's been arguments that the silver is a xanthic, mm-hmm. um, but it, I would assume that if it truly was a xanthic, it would be simple mm-hmm. recessive. And as you just said, and as I've experienced, no. that's not. They don't. They, it's not simple recessive. Place. It's yeah. not how it shows itself. Yeah. All right, but, cool. Well, I'm glad you brought that in at the end. That's what I got. We should have had that about 20 <laughs> minutes ago, but that's okay. We, we got it in there. So. <laughs> All right. Well, this was absolutely fantastic, and given the nature of that collection, we will absolutely have you back on again. If you want to come back, we would love to have you. So this is the first of, of many, hopefully, with, with Glenn. But if people want to see your beautiful photography that we've talked about oh so much, uh, where would people go to find you and maybe talk to you about some of the snakes you keep and and look into babies or, or anything of that nature? Yeah, I, I all my babies that I have for sale are, I put on Morph Market, okay. so just Glenn Reptiles at Morph Market. But if you want to see pictures, I've got a lot of great pictures on Facebook, <laughs> uh, Glenn Reptiles on Facebook. And if you go to photo albums, the pictures are divided by animal and so it's a pretty good way to find what animals look like and that sort of thing and then i also have an instagram and 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 if you do tiktok follow me on tiktok because i only got 69 (laughs) followers i did it because my high young high school kid Uh friends are are doing the tiktok (laughs) thing and i was like okay i'm gonna do a tiktok and i'm like i'll have i'll have more followers than you in a month i told this guy and I cannot get into TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so, cool. boost that number. Let's let's try to get there up you over go. seven. All right, cool. Everybody, go to Glenn's TikTok <laughs> right now. I would go, but I'm not on TikTok because I have to draw a line somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, that's. Yeah, I'm afraid I drew my line a little late. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Alrighty, well, um, those of you interested in finding me, it's Dr. Crawdad on Instagram, uh, Zach Lopeman on Facebook, and as always, if you're interested in grad school and you want to work with snakes or crocs um, or turtles or salamanders, frogs, any of the above, uh, please reach out to me. Um, I'm, I'm, we're starting to make some really, really, really cool connections in the zoo world and i can't talk about them until they're official but i can't wait to talk about them because they're so close to being official it's ridiculous <laughs> uh, i'm going to actually be working on some of my dream projects i had to pinch myself after i had the conversation i had earlier or sorry late last week but i'll keep everybody in suspense so that's where you can find me uh and clint where can people find you uh, you can find us on facebook at metazotics uh, instagram metazotics llc uh, you can reach out to me personally, Clint Bartley, also on Facebook and uh, on Instagram. You can always email us, metazotics at gmail.com. Last but, I'm sorry, metazotics at, yeah, gmail.com. And last but not least, forgot to mention this earlier, metazotics.com. We now have all of our supplies and dry goods posted on the website, able to ship them out all over the country. So oh, hit them up. Check it out. Okay. And then... <laughs> In honor of Matt, who can't be here today, Serpimitra. See what our our brother from another mother's doing. So there you go. All right. Well, this was fantastic. Thank you, Glenn. And uh, yeah, my pleasure. It's our pleasure as well. So Absolutely. whatever whatever time you're listening to this, morning, afternoon, evening, or night, hope you're having a good one. Later. <laughs>